All right, are you ready? Yeah. Ready to learn about light and lasers. Okay, let's go. So, uh, I got a question for you. What is light? What is light? And so, microphone, please. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, yes, tell us. Uh, photon particles or photon waves, whichever you choose, um, moving through space at the speed of light. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Does anybody have anything to add? <laughs> All right. Yes. I know that it, um, because it takes the sun a little while to get light f fr from the sun to here, if you look at Mars through a telescope, you're actually looking at Mars about 13 minutes ago. 13 minutes ago. Wow, that's, that's unlucky. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Uh, that factor is caused by the fact that light cannot move any faster or slower than it always is, which c means that you're always, every it, speed is constant, so you always are looking back at the same, like the sun, you're always looking back eight minutes, Mars, you're always ba looking back 13 minutes, and because light speed can never change. Right. This causes funky things later on. So it takes time for light to get from one place to another. Any one more? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right, so um, you said light is a wave and a, and a particle. That's right, and that's uh, an amazing thing. So let's just start with this. Um, going the wrong way. There, there, light is a wave. Okay, isn't that beautiful? What is a wave? Okay, what is a wave? There is an answer, so I guess I answered it for you. <laughs> Who can read that? Can you read it? A wave changes over space over time. Ooh, very good. That is what it says, and that is exactly true. It's something that changes over space and over time. What changes? Now, that's a, maybe a harder question because it depends on what kind of, it's fine, we'll get there. <laughs> it depends on what kind of wave it is, all right? So what kind of wave is this? Wave. This is a water wave, right? And uh, that's a water wave on the ocean. What is changing? And I will let you answer. Can you hold that back, Tim? It's getting smaller as it gets closer to the beach, which could be your eyes. Okay, so the wave's getting smaller, so that's certainly changing over time. In my um, field, we call that decay, uh, which has a lot, of, a lot of meanings, okay? But really, what is uh, changing? Gosh, um, can you just call it out and then I will repeat it? Oh, it has bubbles, okay, yep, the bubbles are changing over time. Um, anybody else? What's changing? I mean, look, sit, think about being somewhere where you can see waves. The position. The position of the top of the water, right? And it's also moving, of course, and it's going to crash down onto the beach. All right, so what's changing in the water wave? This is the answer that I think um, a lot of us would realize once, once we're reminded of it, is it's the height of the water that's changing, right? Okay, does that make sense? That's the thing that's changing here. Um, for this wave. Um, what changes? <laughs> well, the wave changed. This is a beautiful um, woodcut, uh, Japanese woodcut. Um, the rope. So, let's make another wave. Who was here last week? Two weeks ago, yeah. Who was here last time? <laughs> Two weeks ago. All right, great. So. Um, without breaking anything, possibly. Nick was here. So I want you to take a look at something changing, and uh, I want you to tell me what it is, okay? All right, so the rope is wiggling. What's changing? The height of the rope. All right, well, uh, probably, but I'm going to do this. Um, I, I'm sort of making some tension here, and I'm going to do this. 
And you can see that there's something that's going back and forth on the wave. And we call that a pulse, okay, because it's a, an impulse. It's a very quick and thing that is short in time and short in space, but it moves with a speed, right? And that is the speed of the wave. You talked about the speed of light. Light is a wave, and light has a speed too. It's a very special speed, um, as was also pointed out. And so it's the height of the rope. When I do that, you might not be able to see this as well, but if I go the other way, it's not the height of the rope, but it's another measurement of where the rope is. Right? So what's changing with this wave on the rope is um, is the rope. Why do those people have their hands in the air? <laughs> I mean, there are several possibilities, right? <laughs> OK? But for us today, it's not touchdown. Uh, it's not that uh, Ohio State fumbled. It is the wave, right? All right, so the, these people in the stadium have do that. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I decided that this was the best shot to remind us, but I'll bet we can do that here in the room. Do the wave. Do you think you can do the wave? We got to get the lights up for this. <clears throat> All right, for some reason, I, I like to start the wave over here. You guys know how to do it? What do you do? Right? What's changing? The height of your hands, right? the height of your hands. And this wave is going to move across the room because that's what the wave does. And we're going to start here, and we're going to do it more than once. So don't worry if you don't get it right the first time. <laughs> It'll be fine. And let's do it. OK, ready, set, go. Did you get that, Courtney, <laughs> on camera? All right, that was a wave. Now, that wave, it took some time to get across, right? Do we have a stopwatch? Nick is going to time it. We're going to do it again. You ready? Set, go. All right, what do we get? 2.18. 2, oh my goodness, 0.18 seconds. OK, that's how long it took. Um, Connor is going to try to keep up with the wave. Uh, I've tried this. I, I can't do it. But Connor, Connor's the track star. So uh, he can't go all the way to the corner, but he's going he's gonna to keep up with the wave um, all the way over to here. You guys ready? Set, go. <laughs> all right, how fast was Connor running? What was the speed of the wave? Not fast enough. Not fast enough. <laughs> I think it was, no. Um, so how do we figure out how, how fast Connor was running? We know how long the wave took. Um, what, how are we going to figure out how fast it was? You can time him um, until he gets to the end, and maybe you could time the wave at the same time. Um, and if you want to do some more work, you could see what the difference was between um, the time it took for him to get across the room and the time it took for the wave to get across the room. That is a really, really good idea. Um, another idea. That he ran by the time it took him to run. Okay, if we knew the distance across the room, um, <laughs> you know, it, it turns out I have this very fancy device um, which has a, a laser in it. I guess you can see the laser there. Right? And if I go to one side of the room, and use this fancy device. We'll talk about how this works in just a second. Um, but if we use this fancy device, it says it's about 15 meters. OK, so I like meters because um, I'm a scientist. But how much is that in a more conventional distance? Monica? It's about 50 feet. It's about 50 feet. OK, so we could write 50 feet, or we could write 15 meters. Now, who can do that math? <laughs> it's just about seven, thank you, <laughs> meters per second. That is the speed of our SMP, Saturday morning physics wave, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's what we've, what we've got here. Um, now, I, I want to just talk about, I don't know where I put it already. Um, anyway, this device, thank you. 
Um, this device uses light, and it, I want to show you something special about it, which is when I do this, or try to do this, can you see that it's not continuous? It's pulsed. There's a very, very short pulse. Remember I used the word pulse to describe the short um, time and, and distance on the rope when I hit the rope. So uh, this is a pulse of light, and this device knows when the pulse of light left, and it has another uh, window on it that measures when the pulse of light bounces back. We have a special word for that, which is reflect, right? Just like a mirror reflects. All waves uh, have this property that they reflect when they reach a boundary like a wall. So how long does that take? Well, actually, about 70 nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. That's a billionth of a second, about 70 billionths of a second. A really short time, and it takes sort of special modern electronics to be able to do that. This is the special speed, the speed limit of everything um, physical <laughs> uh, in nature, in the universe. 299,792,458 meters per second, exactly. There's no dot one, two, or anything like that. And that has to do with the way that we define the quantities meters and seconds. And in fact, the meter is defined by making light um, have exactly that. And that's about 186,000 miles per second which is actually what I learned when I was miles per hour. Did I say second? Yeah. That is not right. It's miles per second. <laughs> All right. Um, now, I'm going to talk about uh, a special wave. Yes, question. Uh, does that happen because of the natural frequency of the rope? The faster you're oscillating, the closer to the natural frequency of the rope you get. So the number of that, that's, say that's four well, we'll talk about this. But <laughs> All right, that's, um, that's right, and that's a very special uh, physical phenomenon, which is not the most important thing I want to show here about waves. But I do want to talk about standing waves, um, which are waves that occur between boundaries. We could try, I wanted to try this experiment real quick uh, to make a standing wave with the Saturday morning physics wave. So uh, <laughs> that is a, is a difficult thing. So uh, what we would have to do, I'll just tell you, and we won't really try it, is we'd have to have a wave coming from that side of the room to your left, and a wave coming from that side of the room that essentially start at the same time. And then they somehow meet in the middle. And if, if you were... <laughs> uh, practiced enough, it would just take some practice, then you would get a wave that kind of looks like a part of this, right? Uh, a part of what we see here. So um, what we see here, as he pointed out, is that's sort of a half a wave. This is a full wave, etc. cetera, all right? So we have um, this device here. I need a volunteer, somebody who thinks they can turn a knob with instruction. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pick you. All right. Come on over. All right, so this device um, is, well, it's, it's not unlike a rope, right? It's just a small rope, which we call a string. I'm going to get the microphone. <laughs> What's your name? Leah. Leah. Okay. Hi, Leah. Um, Leah, we're going to uh, sort of turn this on. And there's a knob here. And I want you to turn the knob this way, just a little bit. Okay? And she's turning the knob. We call it clockwise when we look from above. And what's happening? Okay, you could stop there. Okay, what's happening as she turns the knob? I'm going to just... Okay, keep turning it a little more, just a little more, and a little more, 
Okay, let's stop there for a sec. As she turns the knob, what's happening, Leah? It's going. It's spinning faster. It's going faster. Okay, we call, we call this a frequency, revolutions per minute, revolutions per second, revolutions per hour. Uh, great. All right, and then she's actually picked a very special speed, right? And that speed is one where the entire wave, okay, that's an entire cycle, we call it, of a wave, um, fits between the two ends, that special length. And what's really happening is one wave is starting here and going that way. It's reflecting off the end on your left and, um, and coming back. Try to tell you a little faster. You know how to make it faster? Great. All right. So now she's gotten one and a half in there. It's increased by one half of a wave, um, a length that we call a wavelength. OK, go ahead, a little more. Wow, and go. See how, see how far you can go. OK, one more. You know, I think she's practiced this. <laughs> She does this better than I do when I, I'm the one with gets to turn the knob. Okay, go again. Try again. Faster. And what do you see about the, the size of the wave? It's getting smaller. smaller as the wave goes faster. So the length gets less, the speed gets, or frequency gets more. You think you can go again? Think there's any more available? You're really amazing, Leah. How many is that? I don't think I've ever gotten that many. I bet you can do one more. <laughs> Woo! Oh, a little unstable. Ten. Ten. Yeah, ten. And how many full wavelengths is that? Where a wavelength is two of them? Um, a wavelength is two? Yeah. Five, exactly. Very good. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, now, this is extremely important in our lives for any number of reasons. Standing waves. Um, lasers uh, turn out to arise because of standing waves. Uh, but so does music, right? So... You guys want to dance with me? I didn't think so. All right. So uh, yeah. So just to reiterate what Leah showed us was that there's a special length. OK. Did I get that right? Uh, <laughs> that's half of it, the wavelength. And there's a special rate, which is the frequency. Um, OK. Something else about light that I don't think I heard at the beginning, but, but you may have said it and I forgot already, which is that it's what's changing with light is electric and magnetic, we call them fields. Okay, these are properties of electric properties and magnetic properties um, that change in space and change in time. That's what makes it a wave. So something electric. Monica is going to demonstrate uh, something that should be, from, well, sort of familiar, <laughs> but you've probably never seen before uh, that has to do with electric fields. So what I have over here, we have dubbed the killer capacitor. Um, and that is, it comes with a story. It has nearly harmed two professors pretty bad. Um, but they survived, and we have since encased it in a box to make it safe. Um, so you learn the hard way, but it wasn't me, so, you know. Um, but what we have here are three very large pulse capacitors that are charged to a high voltage. They um, add up to about 20 microfarads. And just to give you perspective, this is what a low voltage capacitor of the same capacitance looks like. And so what we do is we charge these capacitors in parallel. And I'm going to go ahead and do that while I finish explaining. So I have to open the circuit, turn on the power, or the incoming voltage. 
And over here, I have a 4 and a 0.3 turn coil that when I close the switch, all of the stored energy inside of these capacitors are going to be released in one large pulse. It's going to then discharge through that coil of wire. When current goes through a coil of wire, it produces its own magnetic field. That magnetic field is going to interact with a ring that I've placed on top of this coil. That ring is going to have the current induced in it from that magnetic field, producing its own current. And what I have done is I have placed a piece of aluminum foil over a gap in this uh, ring, so it's going to be a complete circuit. But when I put as much energy through that ring as I'm about to, you will see that it's going to fail at that bridged gap because there's a lot less metal over that bridge than the rest. And you will see a nice spark and noise and everything else that goes with it. And so I'm going to ask you guys to cover your ears. I cannot do that, so give me one second. All right. We're going to count down in three, two, one. So as you can see, there was a lot of force. But we were able to then uh, create a spark from all of that energy stored inside of those capacitors. So in case you forgot what electric is, that was electric. <laughs> now what about magnetic? What do we know about magnetic? OK, I need another volunteer. Do you want to do it? Yeah, come here. Come on up. Great. What's, <laughs> what's your name? Do you mind? Evelyn. Evelyn. OK, great, Evelyn. Evelyn, have you um, done? Th Played with magnets? Yes. Yeah, we call it playing because we're scientists. And so I have one here. All right, I'd like you to hold it. OK? And it is heavy, yeah. It's made of uh, steel, basically, uh, which has a lot of iron in it. That's a very special material which you can make a magnet out of. Um, OK, so I just want you to, can you hold this in, in one hand uh, so you can talk into it? And I want you to hold that out towards me. And I have another one here. You might notice that this one is red and, and white. There's a special thing about magnets uh, is that they are red and white. Or, because <laughs> this one is too. But red and white are different, right? So they just basically have two different uh, sides to them. And uh, what I'm going to do is, um, is bring this uh, magnet here. And bang, they stick together, right? But the red sticks to the white. Now, getting them apart's a little difficult. Good, you're strong. Wow. OK, now what's going to happen when I do this, excuse me, uh, where the red is trying to get close to the red and the white's trying to get close to the white? I played with <laughs> magnets like that. I put one of those on the table. Then I just like do that, and it kind of slides around the table. It slides around the table. Good. But have you ever done it with a physics professor before? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a physics, I right. I don't have a physics pro um, professor. I'm only in fifth grade. Oh, well, <laughs> we have to fix fifth grade, I think. OK, thanks very much. All right, so but what you saw was that was, that was, that was hard. And thanks. You're an expert in magnets, and you're very strong. So thanks very much, Evelyn. You're welcome. <laughs> so that, that's just a reminder. I mean, right, these, uh, the magnets never didn't touch when they were repelling each other, right? This, so there's somehow this force acted at a distance, and that's a very important aspect uh, of forces. So this is a wave, right? The electric fields and the magnetic fields are changing. The, in this picture, the electric field is up and down, okay? And the magnetic field is, is left and right. And for waves propagating uh, in a vacuum, I heard that term, or uh, in air mostly, but not necessarily in materials. These are always perpendicular, and when one is a maximum, the other is a maximum. So that is the nature. And then you see that V? OK, that's the direction the wave is moving. And the V stands for what? The velocity or the speed of the wave. That's right. Very good. OK, so light is an electromagnetic wave. Light is a. 
It's an interesting term. So oftentimes we mean that's the thing that our eyes sense. That's what we can see, light that we can see. But electromagnetic radiation, many know, uh, is not just what we can see. Um, it uh, goes from red to blue. That, those are the colors of the rainbow, uh, or the colors of our coats, which is even more important today. Um, and also, light carries energy. Now, how do we know that? Where did we see energy that was related with electric and or magnetic fields? I invite, oh yeah, here's one over here. Good. <laughs> did you have your hand up? OK, what were you going to say? Can you hold that, Barbara? <laughs> or translate for us? <laughs> All right. Barbara will take care of it. All right, we'll just pass it back. OK. Was there any energy in the spark that Monica produced for us? There sure was, right? There was energy that made sound. There's energy that made light. And there's energy that made motion uh, of that. And what about, could you see that I was getting tired when Evelyn and I were trying to get the uh, magnets pushed towards each other? So that, you know, I was running out of energy. But uh, light carries energy. How else do we, have we experienced, especially on a sunny day? Yeah. Sunlight, which is light, obviously, uh, gives heat. That's why the Earth is hot. That's why. Right. OK, great. So the sunlight, light warms us. OK, so that's, uh, that's another really good example. Um, now, is there, or what is there, uh, for electromagnetic waves inside the red? That's a special term, inside the red. Uh, Inside, I guess if we use the right prefix, would be infra. So that's called infra, infrared. And uh, what's beyond the violet? Ultra. ultra means beyond and ultraviolet. Very good. OK? Right. Our eyes cannot sense them. Some animals' um, eyes uh, can sense that light. And so, uh, special devices can do it, too. We happen to have one of these special devices. Who's going to run this, is it? <laughs> OK. Monica is going to do this. This is a special camera, which we have to switch over to, um, which measures the inside the red or infrared light. And when it comes up, we could act. Can we get those lights off for a minute? This is light you can't see. Now, see if you can find yourself. Stop a sec, Monica. All right, so, <laughs> you know, the people wearing glasses, the people wearing glasses um, are shielding us with their glasses from their, the infrared vision. That is to say, the infrared coming from their eyes or what's behind their glasses. So that's darker. You see the people with glasses is darker? The hot spots are more yellow, and that's you. And I, I don't know exactly what your surface temperature is, but it's, you know, 90-ish. It's pretty warm, right? Because we can take our, uh, our temperature, see if we have a fever, just with a, a thermometer that measures externally. Well, I'll let you play with this for a while. <laughs> now, if your forehead isn't warm enough, who thinks that they can find something to show the camera that's even warmer? Think about taking your temperature. <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> All right, so, yes, what do you think? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, all right, that's fine. All right, let me make a suggestion. <laughs> Something warmer than your forehead is where you would take the temperature if you want it to be even more accurate of what's going on inside. You open your mouth. Try it. Go ahead. Right? And leave it open. And it's even, it's even hotter, guys. So the hot breath. OK. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what it's like. It's light. It's electromagnetic waves. 
but uh, it's not visible to our eyes, right? We just don't take our temperature this way. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Monica. <clears throat> In fact, you guys don't want to stop, I, that's fine. <laughs> we can turn it on and later again. <laughs> I, I could stop now, it's the best part of the show. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, so actually, any frequency, or any wavelength, remember frequency and wavelength are related to each other, higher frequency, um, shorter wavelength, et cetera, all the way from the very lowest, and these are all things that we observe and actually either use in technology or can measure, all from the very lowest, um, basically magnetic fields or electric fields that uh, are produced um, in running uh, motors and things like that, uh, AC power, all of radio communication, infrared, which is heat, which is what this camera measured that you just saw, and then the visible, um, what we call the visible light, then beyond violet or ultraviolet, then we have x-rays that you experience at, at the dentist, etc., cetera, and, um, and on to uh, that. And we've related, I'll be right with you, we've related uh, the wavelength, so the zeros on the bottom uh, represent the number of zeros on the special units that are used to describe the frequency in how many times per second uh, it vibrates. So kilo is a thousand, giga is a billion, tera is a trillion, peta is a quintillion, and I'm going to stop there, but you can see there are a lot of zeros as you go to exa and zeta. Um, yeah, okay. Now, what were you going to ask or say? Um, so, Here. microwaves are not on there. Wouldn't they be between infrared and radio? Yes. <laughs> the question was, where are microwaves, uh, radio frequencies? We have names that are a little bit uh, uh, fuzzy and what the boundaries are between those, but when you think of a microwave oven, et cetera, that's in a, a frequency that's um, above the radio frequencies, but less than the visible. Or infrared. <laughs> yes, and then the routers and the radio waves in your house. All those are sort of gigahertz things. Okay, um, now we are going to talk about something called polarization. Um, and polarization is about the direction. I'm going to start with the rope, I think. Or is the rope gone? <laughs> Well, I won't use the rope, that's fine, we'll just use this. All right, so polarization is um, the phenomenon when the radio waves, or the electric field, excuse me, points always in the same direction. So if it's always pointing up or down, that would be polarized. But actually the light coming from these lights onto me, for example, the, mostly the lights coming from the screen towards you, um, it's not always pointing up and down. It's sort of pointing up and down, and then it's pointing that way, and then it's pointing that way, and I should play good vibrations again, shouldn't I? But um, yeah, so it's sort of moving around all the time. But there are ways to make sure that the light is always pointing in the same direction. Now, it depends what produces the light sometimes, and it also depends how the light interacts. Um, this says on off, so I think that's exactly the way to do it. Uh, what we have here, is um, this is venerable, okay? There, I know there are people in the audience. Did I break it all right? <laughs> um, there are people in the audience who know what these are. These are, are vacuum tubes that are used, and it's a special device that has uh, magnetic and electric fields that it produces. And uh, these are radio waves that um, at 82 megahertz, million times per second, that are essentially electric charge going back and forth only in this direction. And um, it is uh, possible to transmit energy to this light. I hope you can see that this light bulb is shining. And when I turn that off, the light bulb stops shining. So that's just, that's just my proof, all right? But there's something special about this called an antenna and these called the antenna, which is a charge can only move along the metal 
of the transmitting antenna or the receiving antenna. Did I break it again? That's really amazing. All right, because I have to show you one more thing. It's stronger today than usual. <laughs> Probably because it's sunny out. There's no relation. All right, so we'll do that. All right, so I'm going to stay over here. Can you see it shining? All right, now I'm, the electric field's only this way, so I'm going to turn it like this. And it goes off. I'm going to turn it back this way goes on, goes off, and it goes on, all right? So the electric field from the transmitter is always this way, but the receiver is changing. And so uh, it's also not, just doesn't turn off and on, it's on, dimmer, 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 you can't see it shine, brighter, 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 um, and then dimmer, 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 dimmer. So that's a special phenomenon that we call polarization. And um, we've given you a, an apparatus here today, a physical uh, instrument, to measure polarization. And uh, so when you walked in, uh, hopefully you got it. It is this one. I have a bigger version of it. And um, I want to show you, we're not going to do the rope, that's just fine. Um, a couple of phenomena, and I'm going to start with this. OK. <laughs> so what we have here is a light bulb. It's, a, it's kind of a beautiful light bulb. This might be better with, also without the lights in the back. Um, this is a very long filament. You'll see this filament again. And we actually have around it a polarizer. So not the white cards, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and so on. Um, <laughs> but the other grayish piece of plastic, and uh, hold it up, and do what I did, is rotate it. And you should be able to find a very special, our eyes are extremely sensitive. So not only is this part of our instrument, but our eyes are part of this instrument. It's one of the best optical instruments there is because it can measure light over such a broad range and make adjustments. We'll talk more about the eye in just a minute. So can you find where the filament is essentially invisible? So that is um, op polarization of light. The source of light is polarized. The card, the polarizer, we call it a polarizer, a polarization analyzer in front of your eye um, only lets light through when the electric field is, is in a very particular direction. Um, there are a lot of ways in which uh, polarization is used. If you look over here, um, we have a computer screen. Look at me. All right, so we have this, can everybody see the computer screen? All right, so give it a try. Try your polarization analyzer and rotate, and um, I, I can do it too, just to, and you can just find, this is called extinction, you know, where you get absolutely the minimum amount of light transmitted. So the way that all uh, modern television and, which is used as a technology called liquid crystals, or LCD is liquid crystal display, um, does it with polarized light, right, and the, and the crystals, and the liquid crystal change the polarization of the light and allow it to come through where you get white, the combination of red, green, and blue, uh, or just blue, or just red, et cetera. So that's one of the ways in which, is that good? <laughs> uh, polarized light is, it, it's ubiquitous, right? Everybody does that. You could try looking at your phone screen after the show, not now, uh, uh, because we don't allow people to look at their phones in the classroom. Um, Okay, so here are uh, some examples. The computer monitor I showed you. Oh, yeah, this screen. Now, the projector also works with similar technology, but there's a funny thing about it, right? You're not really seeing much. And that's because that light is not polarized in a single direction, which we call linearly polarized, but the electric field is rotating as it propagates. That's called circular polarization. So it's changing in a very steady, special way. That's extremely important for a lot of optics technology. Um, but uh, 
it's more expensive and uh, works much better when you're trying to project off a screen. Um, the upper right picture shows uh, the Great Barrier Reef with a polarizer rotated in four different directions. The same shot with polarized light, and that indicates that light under the sea is polarized, and it's polarized by the light having to pass, well, for two reasons. One is that the sky itself, which is uh, mostly blue, especially today, nice blue sky day for us, um, and you get to take your polarizers home and, and examine the sky. So I urge you, once you leave, to actually take your polarizer outside. Don't look at the sun, look at the blue sky, and uh, rotate it and, and watch what happens. Undersea, undersea animals use polarization. Uh, in fact, the polarization of skylight is used in, in navigation. And there's another application um, which we are not going to show you, per se. Uh, no, that's the uh, stress. But this is a picture taken through a polarizer out uh, of an airplane window in the lower left. And what's happening here is that the plastic in the windows, you know, if you've been on an airplane, there's plastic in the windows, and that plastic has uh, special directions in it. It's called, it's stressed because it's mounted mechanically. Uh, and then there's pressure changes in all of this. And so it becomes an analyzer of polarization that depends on color. This is a technology that's used to make, uh, for example, plexiglass models of engineering structures, buildings, bridges, et cetera, put weights on them or loads on them, and then use uh, polarized light. Uh, we use, in my research, glass a lot, which is melted and then uh, made into very special shapes, a uh, technique called glass blowing. And all of the stresses need to be taken out, or as soon as you do the wrong thing with the glass, it'll shatter. So the glass blower uses this for analyzing. OK, so now um, we're going to talk about images. That was polarization. Take your polarizers home, look at the sky. Now, <clears throat> um, optical instruments, and the one we've used already today is our eye, right? Uh, is, is one of them that we've used today. Optical instruments uh, work because they can change the path of light beams. So what we have here in this tank, can you, can you see this tank, is um, uh, three parallel light beams. And I have various optical surfaces here um, that, that do things. So let's just, uh, you tell me, uh, if I take this device and put it in here. Should I go up or down? Can you see that? What do you think this device is doing? What are they saying? <laughs> it's reflecting the light, right. It's, it's a mirror. It's a shiny mirror. Thanks, Nick. Um, it's a shiny mirror, and it's just like the mirror that um, you combed your hair or brushed your teeth, or didn't this morning, um, <laughs> uh, in front of, uh, and, and maybe should have. But uh, with that in mind, that is a, a flat mirror, and, and it's, a, it's a very useful device. If we have a curved mirror, something else happens, um, which is, that the beams get bent in, on reflection in different directions. And you see this very special spot where they come together on your right, to the right of the mirror? Uh, we call that a focal point. That's where the light beams converge. And now we have an optical instrument that works a lot like a lot, many telescopes. Um, another way to change the direction of light is with um, something that light basically goes through. We call that transmission. Um, and this is a, a block of plastic, so it's kind of transparent. But um, there's both reflection at the surface. And you, can you see that the light beam is changing direction a bit as it, as it transmits through? Now, if that surface is curved, that surface is curved like this one, we can also get a focus. But now it's on your left because the light's moving in that direction and this, this transmits it. So these phenomena of basically changing the direction of light are used in optical instruments and used by our eye um, to do this. So I want to talk about how we use that, we and, and many species, 
uh, for seeing. But I'll start with this eye chart, because I want to ask uh, what you see. Uh, you know, the, the eye doctor would say, can you read, any eye doctors in the room? Yeah? So what do you normally uh, ask? This, uh, this has to be at a very specific distance and a very specific size in the optometrist's office. But um, there are a few things of note here. What do you see that you might not see in the doctor's office? Yes? Thanksgiving related stuff, right. Okay, in, in particular pi, 3.1415, okay. So, um, yes, and, and turkeys. And you may or may not know that the, uh, this particular eye chart has my initials in it, uh, TEC. So, so that's kind of cool. All right, so I need another volunteer. Okay, I'll take, you're great. Um, <laughs> Come on over here. We're going to hide behind the bench. Come on. <laughs> okay. So, um, what's your name? Ethan. Ethan. Okay. Nice. Okay. Very good. We are uh, going to have what we have here is something that has many features that our own eyes have. Okay. So this uh, uh, big uh, flask has a special material in it, it's sort of greenish, and I'm going to turn it on. And it glows. Do we want those off too? Probably. Excellent. All right, it glows, right? Um, but what does this have in common, you can answer this, Ethan, um, with our eye? It, take, it takes in the light. And it, if it had a brain, it could think and see. Wow. If it had a brain, <laughs> it could think and, and see. Right. Uh, what about its shape? It's spherical. It's spherical. Uh, and some of us would say round. because, But spherical is a pretty good description of most of this. Our eyeballs are mostly like that, too. Uh, certainly round. But they have a curved surface. Right. So recall that the curved surface that I had over there produced a focus. And you can see that the light is converging a bit, right? Now, the back of our eyes, do you know what, the, um, what, what it's called at the back of the eyes, the organ at the back of the eyes is? Retina. The retina, right? And the retina has uh, light sensors in it. And as you said, if this could think, and we had light sensors there, it could send that and we could interpret what, what we're seeing with those light sensors. Um, okay, but that's, that's not really very good, I don't think. The eye, the curved front of the eye, is not getting enough focusing, right? So our eyes have something extra. And it's called a lens, and what we have here is a lens. So I'm going to let you do this for us, which is to take and put the lens in front of the eye um, a little bit away, that the light goes through it, move it towards the eye, because the ends, lens is actually a part of the eye. So this is how our eye works. It's a combination of the curved surface of the front of the eye, which is called the cornea. If you have contact lenses, it just makes that curved surface a little bit different shape. I do. Um, if you have eyeglasses, something different happens, which we'll show you here. And then um, the combination of that and then behind the cornea is a lens that can uh, change shape. And that changing of shape allows us to focus near and far, and as Effen did here, um, he has now made a pretty sharp focus uh, at the, our retina in our model of the eye here. So that's, uh, that's normal. Um, I often do a poll in my classes and so on to say uh, the following questions. How many people are, um, have perfect vision or 2020-ish vision, <laughs> uh, are nearsighted, are farsighted, and don't know? And it usually comes out a little, you know, over 50% are nearsighted. Um, about 20% claim their 2020 vision. Uh, a very small fraction are farsighted, and about 30% don't know. Turns out. Um, okay, but we're going to, uh, Evan, is uh, replace the lens with a lens that isn't uh, quite perfect. So put that in front. 
Okay? So what do you see here? Would you say that the uh, eye is focusing too much or not enough? It's focusing too much. It is focusing too much. The eye, the focusing of the eye is too strong. And this is what is, happens for nearsighted people, most actually a, a majority of the, of the population. So we have to correct that. Right? So we're not going to correct it by going back to you know, the perfect eye. We're going to correct it the way I, I happen to know from our study before that uh, many people have eyeglasses, and I would uh, wager that many people's eyeglasses are correcting myopia or nearsightedness. So let's see if we can find the right correction here. Now, that's too much before you put that in away. That's too much focusing, so we have to reduce it. That's called a negative correction. And the corrections are measured in diopters. Diopters is just sort of one over the distance from the uh, focusing element, the lens, to the focal point, to the converging point. Go ahead. All right, so that's, uh, that's corrected vision. Uh, and that's how it all works. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. So that's an aspect of, of seeing um, that, that I think is very important and, and something to learn about light uh, here today. Uh, here are our pictures of that. Uh, now I'm going to move on to another question uh, and uh, phenomenon, I think mostly to finish up today, which is what happens when two waves meet? OK, great. There's an answer over here. What happens when two waves meet? They they don't make a bigger wave. They just crash into each other. OK. Um, that is definitely one possibility, is they crash into each other and kind of cancel each other a little bit, right? Uh, yes? Um, if they're exact opposite, they'll cancel each other out. But usually, they're not. And they'll just become closer to the same length of a wave. OK. Um, that's. That's right. So that's one example of what can happen. But basically, they combine, right? And remember, the wave is something changing, um, like an electric field or the height of water or, um, or sound, which is a wave. Oh, by the way, that was me. <laughs> Not that long ago. Um, OK, so which? <laughs> We're going to turn this on. Thank you, Nick. We're going to turn this on, and we're going to make Oh, that's really pretty loud. Is that the right frequency? OK, can we, we'll turn it down just a little bit. And which one? So I can control it. Great, thank you. <laughs> All right, good. Um, so you can hear that? Everybody can hear that? That is uh, 2,500 cycles per second, so that's a pretty high and piercing, piercing frequency. But we have here two sources of sound, two waves. Right? Sound is a wave, two waves. Um, the thing that's changing is pressure. That's all I'll say about sound for now. But we're going to do an experiment that everybody is going to take part in. Um, and we need our um, auditory detectors. OK, did you bring them today? All right. Uh, but we only want to use one. So that would be plug and ear. Okay. Uh, it gets confusing if, if you have two detectors. And um, when I turn this on, which I'll mercifully do uh, briefly, all right, I want you to move your detector from side to side, you know, several t about a foot um, or so. And uh, we'll just do this, go back and forth slowly, you know, four or five times, and then we'll discuss what we measure. You know, I have some advice. Everybody, remember the wave? <laughs> Everybody should be not going opposite directions. That's the wrong mode um, of vibration. <laughs> OK, and as Monica said, we want to do it slowly. OK, so I'll guide you. All right, you ready?
All right, what do you observe? What did anyone notice here? Yes, Evelyn. Kind of like this thing, only with sound instead of light. It kind of got quieter when you, uh, for me, it was around when I reached the middle, and then it got really loud when I went over to here. So some places it was quieter, and some places it was louder, and that's because the two sources of sound, I'm going to do this, um, whether it, you, you like it or not. Um, let's just do that experiment again with one source of sound. We should have started there. Turn that off. Ready? See the difference? When there's two sources of sound, you get this loud, soft, loud, soft in space. And with one source of sound, I think probably not very much, right? Um, so what's going on, and this was described very well um, by several people who responded a few minutes ago, which is that the waves are combining, two waves combine, the, whatever the thing that's changing in the wave, the electric field, the pressure of the sound, um, or the height of the water even, are combining, and if they combine when the two maxima, the tops of the waves, are uh, correspond to each other, then we get a bigger wave. And if it happens that the top of one wave, that's what you get here, a bigger wave. And if it happens that the top of one wave corresponds to the bottom of the other wave, as you said, they completely cancel. And this is called interference. We have another word that we sort of loosely apply to a different phenomenon, but also gets applied to interference effects, which is called um, diffraction. And we're going to show you this with light. This is just a picture, which I'll skip. Oh, I get to do this one, too, though. <laughs> uh, tuning forks. It's not just two sources that are different in position, but they can be different in um, frequency as well. So this is important for people who tune musical instruments, for example, but that's very pretty. Same pitch? Not quite. Right? So they're not, they're not in tune. I can actually tune it a little bit. Um, and when I tune it a little bit, you see I change that uh, result of the differing frequencies, which is called a beat. Okay? And the musicians, many musical instruments are tuned uh, by noticing beats. And then there's also, when you have two sources that are different sides of a, of a thin film, and animals take advantage of this, like this beautiful moth, um, that uh, then uh, you get these wonderful combinations of colors uh, that work. So while that spins, I'm going to show you, uh, this is the wrong one. <laughs> That's the red green, sorry. We are keeping to the script, okay. All set? Good, sorry, thank you, okay. Is that both of them? Okay, good. All right, and then we gotta move it up. So there on the right-hand wall of the room uh, are a set of spots that are coming because that's like moving your ear from side to side where there's uh, where the loud sound is where we see light in between. If you look really, really carefully, and I'm not going to explain it in any detail today, you can see lots of little uh, light patterns in between these big spots. But let's just focus on the big spots and the fact that we have red and um, green. Ah, I broke it. I see, I turned the wrong thing. There. Red and green. Uh, and the, the center one mostly coincides, but the uh, outer ones are not the same. That means that something's different about red and green. The difference is the wavelength, and green has a shorter wavelength than red, and so it, it actually moves uh, less far uh, in this pattern. So we'll come back to this in just a moment, but uh, that is an example uh, of, of diffraction. Diffraction, uh, interference, or diffraction. This is called diffraction, but it's really interference of 
two or more sources of light. That is electromagnetic radiation in the form of x-rays um, reflecting from the elements of what's shown on the left, which is a, the double helix structure of DNA. And that very special pattern on the right is not unlike what we saw here. We will use that again. Uh, yeah. um, it, so that's one of the uh, very famous um, examples and uh, discovering the structure of, of DNA, which is extremely important. This is a special kind of uh, device which uses the interference of light to measure the positions of two sources, which are mirrors. Um, and uh, this is called LIGO, which is the Light Interference Gravity Wave Observatory, LIGO, uh, which is uh, there are actually three of them in different places in the world, in um, Louisiana, Washington State, and in Europe. Um, and those are uh, several kilometer long uh, pipes. All the air, or most of the air, is sucked out of those pipes. We'll show you why in just a moment. And at the ends of the pipes are mirrors. And basically, those mirrors are the two sources, um, not unlike our two speakers. So when it comes back, um, then we can detect. And the detection will be loud or maximum if uh, the light waves uh, correspond to each other. Their peaks are in the same, uh, come at the same time. But if the peak of one in the trough of the other or the minimum of the other come at the same time, then there will be nothing. So uh, that is very measurable. And if the mirrors move just a little bit, um, then you can detect that. And what makes those mirrors move? Or why was this device built? Well, this was built to detect what are called gravity waves, predicted by Einstein and observed in the last decade in um, when two black holes collided. So here we are. I got to say black holes. <laughs> um, and so they, they come and they basically change uh, the structure of space. And this ripples out, just like it's traveling at the speed of light, the very same important velocity uh, that is the nature's speed limit. And it makes a pattern in time that, that looks like what's shown in the bottom here. So this is a, one of the greatest discoveries of this century so far, I'm sure. One of the maybe two, some people would say, or, uh, or more, but at least in physics. But I want to talk just real briefly why the air is removed from LIGO. So this, what's shown here in the middle, is just the kind of pattern that LIGO would detect. And that pattern would change when the, move, when the mirrors uh, vibrate differently. And uh, the two sources, it's just like the LIGO interferometer, except it's a lot smaller. Right? So I call it the SMP interferometer, um, so SIGO. And, uh, but the thing is, the light has to pass through air. We do not, I have not sucked all the air out of the room yet. Uh, OK, so, um, so what I'm going to do is change the pressure a little bit of the air. I have a syringe here. And I'm just pulling the syringe out. And you can see that that pattern changes. So air is actually a very important uh, thing that would foil that experiment uh, if that were not the case. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is, is um, another application of interference, which is the second device that we've given you, which is um, the white card. The white cards, do I have a white card? The white card. <laughs> Uh, say, uh, find the writing that says this side up, or up, or an arrow, and look at the arrow and make sure it's up. <laughs> okay? So that's, that's really all it takes. Now, um, we have a source of light here. This is our uh, light bulb, which is a hot filament. The electrons are moving in every different direction. I want you to know it's not. It's not polarized now because we've removed the polarizer. And what you should be able to see is if you hold one eye, OK, so close one eye. We're using only one optical instrument. And uh, hold the card in front of your eye. Most people, that will be their right eye, unless you're left-handed or left-eyed. And don't, don't move the card. But off to the left or right, you should see the filament spread out into colors. Say ooh if you've seen that. 
That's not enough ooing. <laughs> a little more ooh, right? OK, so, so keep working at that. Um, hydrogen. So this is just really instruction on how to use this instrument. It's called a diffraction grating, uh, but it's really multiple s a source of interference. So we're going to turn this off. Do not move the cards. Keep doing what you're doing, but we're going to change to hydrogen. What do you see? You should see something like what's, what's on the left, which is some bright lines, but not the rainbow, not the continuous rainbow that you saw before. And this is a characteristic. We call it the spectrum, or it's the uh, light signature of hydrogen atoms. We have um, helium. Is that working? Make sure you always have, the, don't change the up. All right. So helium gives you more of these uh, bright lines. And good? I can't tell you what you're seeing. But you should see what's on the left. And then the next one, the last one, is called neon. It's just beautiful to look at. And you understand why uh, neon is so important for uh, you know displays and artwork and things like that. OK, so what is different between the white light thanks, Monica. What's different between the white light and the uh, that's fine, leave that. Uh, and the, the special glowing tubes is that the special glowing tubes, there's only very specific colors, right? And that's what we show here uh, for. That's what you kind of should have seen for hydrogen, helium, and neon. This was this room a few years ago where everybody had the right side up, as you can see. Um, so this is because of a quantum effect that atoms have very specific energies um, for where the electrons are. And when the electrons move from one, we call energy level, to another, they emit light. This is also the basis of the laser. No, it's all right. Um, <laughs> which uses the, the helium and the neon. So we're not going to bring the laser out right now. Uh, we're going to finish up here just talking about the fact that the, it's really the amount of energy that the colors of light carry that uh, affect our, how we see. So I want you to realize that our, I'll go back, uh, the retina, which Effen de described, <laughs> Uh, for us has light sensors, so that's good enough for us now, that's effective, uh, which are called rods and, and cones. And the, the cones have, uh, they both have special proteins, but every one, uh, there's a diff there are three different kinds, four different kinds of proteins. Um, the ones that matter for color uh, are sensitive to very different colors, red, green and blue. And so that explains why you hear red, green, and blue all the time when it comes to computer monitors and things like that, because that's what our eyes detect. And uh, this is red. Okay. Um, and b before we do that, let's just turn this back on for a sec. And maybe you can help me uh, by lining them up. So I'm going to go black again here. And take a look at the red and green here. There's no question. Uh, that you're seeing green over on the right wall, and that you're seeing red. Now, what Monica's going to do is line up the red and the green. That's just red light and green light hitting your eye. And what do you see right in the middle where they're lined up? Is it working? Yellow. Right? So when your eye sees a combination of the red detectors and the green detectors, your, eye, your brain processes this and says, oh, that's yellow. But it's not. It's red and it's green uh, coming together. So just to prove this to you, I want you to stare at this red star, stare, for 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. 
It worked. So you used them up a little bit. You used up the red opsins uh, momentarily. And so you take red out, and you're left with green and blue, uh, which is uh, cyan. You've heard of that color. That's the color you get in your printer ink, um, along with uh, yellow and magenta, where you work because of subtracting colors. Those are called subtractive colors. And red, green, and blue uh, are mixing colors. We'll do one more that I like. This one's pretty cool. 10 seconds. Take away blue and you get yellow. yellow. Right. Isn't that cool? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Rainbows explained. There's so much here. We're going we're gonna to go over this quick. So I'm just going to show you uh, this video I made uh, of a rainbow that I made and another rainbow. So I am not going to explain rainbows right now uh, unless you want me to. All right. I, I, we're running late, but um, we get to go till 12. Right. So this, uh, I don't know if you recognize that. But um, yeah, so how does a rainbow work? Well, a rainbow works by reflection, uh, but it's reflection inside of a water drop. And what you see in the upper right, it should convince you that when water drops are falling freely, which is what rain is, they're not teardrop shaped. They're, they're basically round because the surface tension of the water um, tries to pull it into the minimum uh, most favored uh, shape, which is a sphere. So this, uh, we're showing you a sphere here. And when the light enters the curved surface, we've seen that, it bends. And the amount it bends actually depends on the color a little bit. In fact, the, towards the blue end, it bends um, more than it does towards the red end. So it follows the path that you see here uh, inside. And it also gets uh, spread out into its colors. The, dif the diffraction gratings, the white cards did this in one way. This is done with a phenomenon called refraction. And we call it dispersion, which simply means spreading things out, dispersing them. And uh, if you were to look up uh, at this pattern, you'd have to look higher to see the color on the bottom than you would on the top. So that's why red is at the top of a rainbow. Now, who's seen a double rainbow? OK, well, uh, they, they're always there, but they're hard to see. You can see they're, they're less bright. And the reason they're less bright is because it's two reflections inside. And the consequence of those two reflections is that the blue ends up on the bottom. So you have to look higher to see the blue. Oops. And uh, oh, come on. <laughs> you have to look higher to see the blue. And that's you see the second rainbow on the upper part of this uh, has the red on the inside. And the lower rainbow has the red on the outside. So that's partly of what explains rainbows. But one of the important uh, aspects of this is that the light gets reflected inside the water drop. And this happens when you have something like water uh, in air and the light is inside the water. So fiber optics uh, work this way. These are extremely crucial uh, to our everyday lives. The light stays inside the fiber and gets transmitted. It gets pulsed for communication. It carries um, optical images uh, with lenses for medical um, exploration, uh, endoscopy, et cetera. So we're going to finish up here today uh, with, well, water. OK, so I, I have this, uh, it's a little bit wet here. I have this water that, um, I'm making a mess already, that uh, will flow out of this. And I have light flow out of this bottle. And I have light, let's uh, hit the B. Should be a way to do this remotely, but I don't know it. Um, go ahead. And when I open the bottle, isn't that cool? Yeah, you can see that the light is guiding, sorry, the water is guiding the light uh, along the path of the water into the bucket. I'm going to try to keep up with this. You can do this at home, right? And I'll show you how. And I'll stop that. 
And um, isn't that amazing how that water carries the light into the bucket and it stays? So that's our story, all about light. We'll review this in a minute. <laughs> but I want to thank you all for coming and, and taking part in this and making this so much fun today. And Monica and Nick and so on. So if you have questions, uh, the programs have a list of uh, what we learned today. Uh, and that's repeated here. So you know, if you have any questions, raise your hands. And we'll get your questions. We may have questions online. We'll do this the normal way we do it um, with people in the audience. Uh, yes, the white cards. Please return the white cards. OK, good. We'll give you a microphone. One sec. OK? Good. Case okay. will, uh, yeah. we'll wait until I'll, I'll it settles check. down a little bit, and then you can ask a question for everybody or just for me? OK. Volleyball. So my name is Carrie Jerry. Um, I'm just One sec. interested here. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know there was a question. OK, great. Bye, Evelyn. Yep, thanks. All right. Um, questions? Yes. Question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, she said to say my name, so it's Carrie Jerry. And my question is, um, where on the spectrum of the energy does um, like direct energy um, technology fall, and then what type of um, technology do they use as far as like uh, reflections in order to create the um, power within the direct energy? Like, like yeah. weaponry, as far as like, weapon, weaponry. Oh, laser weapons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> laser mm -hmm. weapons. Um, well, I don't enjoy talking about weapons. But no, me I'll either. I'll tell but you a couple, yeah. a couple things. So one of them is now that we can point lasers, um, that they're used, uh, or had been used, and I don't know so much anymore, um, for guiding weapons from airplanes to the ground. So the bomber would not uh, you know, time the dropping of the weapon, but it would be laser guided. So there would be a laser spot on the target, made it much more accurate. Um, I don't think lasers are, are used so much to destroy things um, at this point, uh, Star Wars type of things. Or certainly, I hope not. <laughs> Question about weapons. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yes. Light. Water. Light. Water. And it was painted white inside to reflect. And I'll tell you more in a minute. <laughs> Cheng Ming Fan. Professor Tim, I have a question about dark light and dark lightning. And just recently, Later, we see in the video about gamma ray. And can you elaborate a little bit? Dark light and dark lightning. I'm not, I'm not familiar. Well, just for those people who haven't jumped to the YouTube yet, and you can see that gamma ray from outer space uh -huh. looking backwards and the lightning, but under shoot it up the purple color. So my question is, why is purple and called dark light? Maybe I shouldn't yeah. ask the question. As I said, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. But let me, um, 
riff on one thing here, which is that, uh, of course, the spark of lightning is, uh, is white, right? So that means it has uh, all frequencies that we, or all wavelengths that we can see, but certainly it has ones we can't see. And there's a really interesting phenomenon that was discovered, for example, really kind of surprising, but not surprising, is if you have like two pieces of tape and you tear them apart, you can get little sparks of light and things like that. But also x-rays, so invisible and so on. So that may be related. But that's gamma rays. Yeah. Gamma rays. Gamma rays. So x-rays and gamma rays are, um, are, are named that for a, a couple of different reasons. One was that gamma rays were associated with changing energy levels in the nucleus, um, and x-rays would be lower energy or longer wavelength um, than gamma rays. But it's also just sort of the regime uh, or range of, we, we talk about energies. Uh, you pointed out that uh, light is electromagnetic waves that has uh, sometimes photons and sometimes wave ways of behaving. And when we get to gamma rays and x-rays, well, certainly gamma rays, we think more about the photon nature of them. Yeah, there's one back there. This is only so I can hear you, I think. <laughs> um, is the, uh, uh, when you had the experiment with the capacitors where the ring took off uh, when all the energy was released, is that the same basic principle as rail guns? Yeah. It's that you actually produce um, a magnet in the ring, and then that gets repelled by the magnetic field that's produced by the flowing current. And so rather than it being a ring, it's two straight lines, so the projectile itself gets pulled through the rail as the capacitor discharges along each segment as it goes through. So you have a little bit more engineering involved, but it's the same principle. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for coming, those who are left.